Hi everyone, so we're going to get started on topic four, which is all about aqueous solutions and chemistry that occurs in aqueous compounds. And so the first thing is just to understand what aqueous compounds are. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about the different types of chemical reactions that occur in aqueous solutions. And these are going to be precipitation, acid base, and oxidation reduction reactions. Aqueous chemistry has a lot of applications in everyday life, including figuring out concentrations of various contaminating ions in drinking water, all kinds of biological reactions that are all water-based, Photosynthesis, a main energy generating reaction for biological systems, is done in the presence of water and many others. So let's get started with aqueous solutions. We're taking a compound and we're dissolving it in water. We have two things that make up our solutions. Solute is the component that is a smaller quantity. Uh, so if you have salt water, for example, the salt would be the solute. And then the component that is present in a larger quantity is what we call the solvent and in aqueous solution the solvent is always water. Now water is also known as a universal solvent. It really is quite good at dissolving a lot of different types of solutes and the reason for that is because water first off is what we call a polar molecule and what a polar molecule is it's a molecule that has two different poles there's a positive pole and there's a negative pole now the reason water is a polar molecule is because as you learn a little bit later the bond that's formed between hydrogen and oxygen in water is what we refer to as a polar covalent bond where the distribution of the electrons between the two atoms is not even so the oxygen actually has more of the electrons than the hydrogen the water molecule itself when we look at it in three dimension actually forms this bent structure which causes those electron that's not distributed equally to congregate on one end which makes that the negative end and then the other side that doesn't have as many electrons is the positive end because of that it acts a lot like a bar magnet where you have a north pole and a south pole and as you might know from experience if you have a bar magnet if you put another bar magnet next to it then those two magnets can attract each other. Similarly with water molecule because it has a positive and negative it will also attract other positive negative species and there's a lot of them and that's the reason why water can dissolve many many different solutes. We can differentiate the different types of solutes that are present in our aqueous solution by doing an electrical conductivity test and the way this test works is as follows. You put aqueous solution in a container of some kind and then you put two electrodes which is basically pieces of metal that are connected to a source of electricity and then you connect that to some kind of an appliance or some kind of a meter that you can measure in this case we're just using a light bulb to tell whether electricity is flowing or not now the only way electricity can flow through these two electrodes two pieces of metal here these are what we call our electrodes and the only way the electricity can flow between these two electrodes is if the solution can contains ions. So unless you have ions, electricity, which are flow of electrons, can't really go through that solution. So when we see something like this, where the light bulb is completely off, we know that that solution doesn't contain any ions. When we have that type of solution, we call that a non-electrolyte. When we see either a really bright light bulb or we see a light bulb that looks like this, where there is something in there, but it's just not very strong, then we would call these solutions in here electrolytes. If it's really bright, we would call the solution strong electrolytes. If it's dim, we would call it a weak electrolyte. We know then that the non-electrolyte has no ions in it, the strong electrolyte has a lot of ions in it, and the weak electrolyte has very few ions in it. And we can differentiate the types of solutes that will dissolve and produce these three different types of solutions as follows. So if you have a strong electrolyte, your solute would be in one of the following groups. It could be a soluble ionic compounds, also known as a soluble salt, and we will talk a little bit more about them when we encounter the solubility table. Strong acids are also considered strong electrolytes, and there's 
six of these here that I want you to memorize. These are covalent molecules, but when they're dissolved in water, they do break apart and produce ions. And the last category of strong electrolytes are strong bases. These are soluble hydroxide salts. And again, when we encounter the solubility rules, you can see which type of hydroxide salts are soluble. Weak electrolytes are the weak versions of these compounds. So insoluble salts, uh, a weak acid, any kind of acids that's not one of these guys here are considered weak acids. And then weak bases, there's a bunch of them, but the ones that I really want you to remember is NH3 or ammonia. Non-electrolytes are compounds that cannot produce any ions. So by definition, they have to be covalent compounds that are not either an acid or a base, right? So those covalent compounds like sugar, for example, they will dissolve in water, meaning they will mix homogeneously with water, but they're not gonna generate any ions. When we look microscopically at solutes that are dissolved in water, it turns out that they don't always look the same. It really depends on what types of solute you have, whether it's ionic or covalent. So an ionic solute, which looks like this green thing right here, in the solid form of the solute, like sodium chloride is an ionic solute, for example, what that solid looks like, it's just an arrangement of positive and negative ion that are packed together very tightly like that. Now when water comes in and mixes with the sodium chloride, what ends up happening is because water is a polar molecule, it's able to attract the ions in the solid um, ionic compound and break it apart. And when it breaks it apart, the ions get surrounded by water molecules and they become so small that we can't see it. So that's why when you mix your table salt with water, then it looks like a clear solution because those ions are now individual ions. And so that's how an ionic compound dissolves. A molecular compound or a covalent compound dissolves differently. A molecular compound is basically an arrangement of the covalent units, right? They're all combined together. And when water comes in, it breaks that arrangement apart. However, because covalent compounds don't break apart into ions, there's still a unit that looks like this, except that they're surrounded by a bunch of water molecules around them, okay? So you're gonna have to write your equations differently for the dissolved substances. If you have a covalent compound, like the one that we just talked about, this is table sugar. If it's in the solid form, basically it just means that all of these covalent species are all stuck together. When it's in the dissolved form, we would write AQ, next to the symbol AQ stands for aqueous. And so we just say C12H22O11AQ. And the picture you should have in your mind when you see that symbol is this picture right here where individual covalent species is surrounded by a bunch of water particles. Now, if you have an ionic compound, you have to write it differently. If you have table salt, for example, NaCl, in the solid form, it will just be NaCl solid. And again, that's what this unit looks like. That's the NaCl solid. If it's aqueous, they're separated as ions. They're no longer together. So you, the way you want to write it is Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. Again, two different ions that are each surrounded by a lot of water molecules. So as I mentioned earlier, you can differentiate between your strong and weak electrolytes by knowing whether they are what we call soluble or insoluble ionic compounds. The short way we call these compounds are soluble or insoluble salts. So salt is just a generic name we use for ionic compounds. The way we use these solubility rules is we just follow the rules from one to six here, and you take the higher ranking rule at the top as being more important compared to the lower ranking rules. The first one says salts of group one cations and ammonium are always soluble. So in other words, anytime you have a group one cation or ammonium in your cations, then that would be considered soluble. So let's say you have cesium bromide, for example. Okay, well, cesium is a group one. You can check this in the periodic table. And as soon as you realize that, then automatically you would say that cesium bromide is a soluble salt and therefore it will conduct electric current and it will conduct it strongly. If you go to barium sulfate, for example, you're going to have to scroll down here to see where you see either barium or sulfate. And there's no barium, but there is a sulfate. Sulfate is the last rule. Sulfates are always soluble, except when it's paired up with calcium, strontium, barium, and lead. Barium is one of the exceptions. So that tells you that barium sulfate is actually an insoluble salt. So if it's insoluble, that means it's actually going to conduct weakly. So barium sulfate is a weak electrolyte.